Centuries ago, a French philosopher posed the following hypothetical. He said, if I could get a donkey exactly between two equally sized bales of hay, would that donkey starve to death from indecision? There is thankfully no evidence of this ever happening, but one of the reasons I think this example endures is that we have little trouble empathizing with that poor donkey when we're faced with choices about everything from job offers to ice cream flavors. In fact, when you start to catalog the most demanding tasks you face throughout your day, you see choices show up everywhere, gumming up the works, creating bottleneck after bottleneck. We are constantly faced with dozens or hundreds of options for what we can be working on, what we can have for lunch, how to word an email to a colleague, how to convey a complex message in front of a live audience. <laughs> Not all of these decisions are hard, but the ones that are can paralyze us with anxiety to the point that we might put off making a decision, sometimes indefinitely. I study how people make decisions, how they feel about making decisions, and what this teaches us about how we can choose when choosing is hardest. Over the years, my lab has gotten pretty good at getting people to confront tough choices. And one of the things we've learned is that the hardest choices are ones where a person not only feels the same way about their options, but where they feel similarly intensely about those options. In fact, one of the hardest kinds of choices is a choice between multiple things that we really like. Getting offered admissions at multiple dream schools, getting multiple job offers, or even just facing many enticing desserts. This has been called the paradox of choice. We want to have as many good options as possible, but when we're faced with these kinds of win-win choices, we agonize over what to choose. And while it might seem counterintuitive that we would have such a hard time making win-win choices, it turns out that there's a pretty intuitive explanation for this when you look under the hood to understand how the brain makes decisions. When you are faced with a decision like where to go for dinner tonight, research has shown that your brain starts to collect support votes for each of your options. I really love the sushi at this one restaurant, but the desserts at this other restaurant are outstanding. And I've been really meaning to try the cocktails at that other place. Once your brain has collected enough votes about any one of your options, your decision is made. When you're facing a lot of great options, your brain starts to get a lot of votes coming in all at the same time. But that's not the problem. The problem is that while we are counting up these votes, we are simultaneously thinking about the fact that choosing a certain option means sacrificing the others. And so our brains internalize that by counting a vote in favor of one option as a vote against the others. We force our options to interact, to compete with one another. And that's a problem because it turns out that when we force our options to compete, rather than evaluating them independently, it not only makes us more anxious deciders, it also makes us worse at deciding. To show this, we recently had people come into our lab and we showed them groups of products like you might find on Amazon. And we had them pretend that they were adding products to a gift registry. So for instance, they might see a box of chocolates, a wine opener, a coffee table book, and a board game. And for each of these groups of products, we simply ask them, which one do you want most? Now, one important additional piece of information is that before they saw any of these choices, we had participants rate all of the items they might see. And so we knew in advance which items they were most enthusiastic about, like the ones they rated 10 out of 10. And we knew which ones they were less enthusiastic about, like the fours, fives, and sixes. 
And this allowed us to work behind the scenes to prearrange groups of options so that when it came time to make decisions, participants were sometimes facing choices that felt more like a win-win, like a bunch of tens, and other times felt less like this, like a bunch of fives. After they made all of their decisions, we asked participants how they had felt making each of the choices. And as we expected, they told us that they agonized most when they were facing win-win choices relative to when they were choosing between mediocre options. What we wanted to know is, could we make win-win choices less agonizing if we simply got participants out of the mindset of thinking of those options in competition and into the mindset of thinking of them as independent opportunities? In other words, could we get them to think about those choices the way you think about choosing items from a buffet, where you can always come back for more, rather than like when you're choosing from those same items on a menu, where choosing one option typically means you're not going to choose anything else? So in the experiment I just told you about, we occasionally tweak the choice a little bit. Rather than always choosing and then moving on to the next set of options, for some of the choices, we told participants that after they made their first choice, they could then come back and add anything else from that group of products to their gift registry. Importantly, just like before, they still had to choose their favorite option first. We found that relaxing this sense of competition between their options made participants worry less when they were choosing that first option. But not only that, this buffet-like mindset made them more efficient decision makers. They were still choosing their favorite option first, but they were now doing so faster. Now, you might already be thinking to yourselves, this is all well and good, but a lot of the time, choosing one option really doesn't mean that we can't choose anything else. And that's true. But more often than not, we can revisit those other options, whether it's by returning a product, revising that email you drafted, or buying that other product you wanted in, in the future, or sending a follow-up message. You can order a different dish if you didn't like the first one. Our work suggests that it doesn't necessarily matter if you can or will return to this proverbial buffet. If you simply go into your decision by treating your options as though they are inherently independent, that a vote for one doesn't have to mean a vote against the others, that you can make it easier to choose when you're faced with too many good options. But what about when we don't like any of our options? When the restaurants, the school admissions, the job offers are all near the bottom of our list rather than the top? When the choice feels more like a lose-lose than a win-win? we found that lose-lose choices are also especially hard to make. For instance, even though participants in our experiments found it easier to choose between mediocre options than options they really wanted, they also found it easier to choose between mediocre options than options they really didn't want, like the ones. So lose-lose choices can be just as challenging as win-win choices, but for a different reason. The problem with lose-lose choices is not that you're getting too many votes in favor of each of your options, but rather that each of your options is getting more votes against it than for it. It's easy to come up with all of the things we don't like about those options. Those seem to flow naturally. But when we try to count up the votes in favor of those options, we come up short. And as a result, it can take a really long time to find the right choice. And we might look for an escape hatch, a way out of having to make a choice. So we asked, what if instead of counting up votes for lose-lose options in order to decide which ones are good enough to choose, we instead count the votes against each of those options in order to decide which ones are bad enough to let go of? We thought that by changing the goal of the decision from selecting the best option to rejecting the worst one, a person could tune their decision to the direction that votes were flowing in most naturally, the path of least resistance. 
To show this, we recently zoomed in on a major decision that's on many of our minds right now. One that brings my voting metaphor into stark relief. The choice of which candidate to vote for in an election. It turns out that when people don't like any of the candidates being offered to them, they often just sit out of an election. This has been a problem not only in this country, but across the globe, with many prominent leaders being viewed more unfavorably than favorably. We wondered whether people choose not to vote in these cases, in part because they have the wrong kind of voting strategy taking place inside their head. They're too focused on which candidate to vote for, rather than which candidate to vote against. To test this, we had people come into our lab and choose between hypothetical candidates. And just like in our previous experiment, we tailored these candidates to the positions that participants held on issues ranging from healthcare privatization to abortion rights to gun control. This allowed us to create hypothetical matchups so that participants were sometimes choosing between two candidates who were perfectly aligned with their views. Win-win and other times they were choosing between two candidates who were diametrically opposed to their views. Lose-lose. For each of these pairs of candidates, we simply asked participants, who would you vote for? When they got to their lose-lose choices, their choice was not to choose. Instead, for the vast majority of these matchups, more than three quarters they chose a third option that we offered, the no vote option. We then had a different group of people come into the lab and choose between exactly the same kinds of candidates. But rather than choose which candidate to vote for, we had them choose which candidate to vote against, the one they wanted to reject. When they did this, lose-lose choices became some of the easiest for them to make. And their choices not to vote went down drastically. One in four rather than three in four. Rejecting the lesser of two bad options was much more natural for them than selecting the better of those options. Decisions are inescapable. If you're not choosing where to go for dinner, what product to buy, or who to vote for, you're choosing what project to work on, what words to put on the page, how to interact with the people around you. You're choosing which of your belongings to keep and which to let go of. And the thing is, we like having all of these options and we cherish our power to make our own choices. It's not choice that we have a problem with, it's choosing. But by exercising control over how we approach our choices, we can make choosing less agonizing. By evaluating our options independently, we remove the strain that comes with thinking about sacrificing those options that don't get chosen and recognize the possibility that we will have future opportunities to revisit those options, even if we don't. By tuning our decisions to the direction that votes were flowing in most naturally about them, whether they're largely positive or largely negative, we remove the strain that comes with failing to collect enough support in favor of our goal, whether that goal is to select the best option or the worst one. When I struggle with my own decisions, I often find myself thinking back to that poor imaginary donkey starving itself rather than having to choose. The true costs of choosing are rarely quite so severe, but they are substantial and they are ubiquitous. The way we make decisions holds sway over our productivity, our well-being, and our relationships with others. It can even determine who gets to make decisions on our behalf as a society. We can't always control the bales of hay that get thrust in front of us. But we can control how famished we end up. That is, if we so choose. Thank you.